Uh, good morning, my name is Ken Grobe. I'm with Elma Electronic Inc. I'm going to talk about trends in packaging and infrastructure for DoD modular systems. <clears throat> by way of some background, um, packaging standards for years have been driven by Vita and PicMig standards, largely around the Eurocard form factor. And recently we've had an, an initiative, a modular open systems approach, which is coming from the DoD to help address uh, future system needs. So at the top level, an objective of that is to improve capability, compatibility, and cost. And this has led to the development of other standards. So in this slide, we see a group of standards, and some of them are organized by service branch. So a few years back, we heard from the people from the Army um, with a standard called CMOS, which stands for C4ISR EW modular open suite of standards, a real mouthful. Um, and then we also have something from the Navy called HOST, Hardware Open Systems Technologies. And lately, there's been an umbrella standard called SOSA, which is Sensor Open System Architecture. And this has really taken the work done by CMOS and HOST and now taking it forward under one umbrella. And then there are other standards, hence the suite of standards under CMOS, that are used to um, build a set of standards that are used for making systems. They include things like Victory, which is a vehicle communications bus, first initiated by the Army, and then Mora, which is modular open radio frequency architecture, and then another standard called FACE, which has been around for quite some time, which is future airborne compatibility environment. So what are some of the objectives of the modular open system approach? First is it's a collaborative, um, a collaborative effort between government and industry, and it's being um, driven by a consortia. So here to, uh, to have the government express what they need in industry to collaborate and achieve those goals. Um, some of the top uh, objectives are to specify base system architecture for common systems, and one that's uh, near and dear to our hearts is selecting a hardware standard, and this has been OpenVPX. Um, one of the things that's been a problem with VPX um, since it, it first started was interoperability. How do you get interoperability across modules? Um, and this requires constraints with the slot module profile, which has been an objective of the work. Um, something else that's new to OpenVBX, well, not really that new, but um, now imposed is system management. So Vita 46.0. 11 is now a requirement, where that's been a requirement in things like ATCA with uh, other shelf management standards. Another challenge has been to normalize the power um, interface definition. Here where power supplies um, are now being simplified to make them more uh, interoperable at the system level. And lastly, with capability, um, one tends to have higher power. So there are a need for new cooling techniques to be able to cool the uh, power dissipation of the modules that are being used. So if we look at um, constraining the slot profile, this collage is a set of SOSA aligned slot profiles that have been introduced to Vita. And the objective is to be to divining slot profiles that are needed to build systems around sing single board computers, payloads, ethernet switches, and so forth. To do that, one needs to get rid of what you see in the middle and um, the slide that's in the 6U slide um, with white space, and one wants to define those signals. So where you see colors, there's signal definition. Where you see signal def definition, there's constraint. And when you have constraint, then you have interoperability because one manufacturer's profile will match, or implementation will match the other. And uh, this can help with compatibility and interoperability. So as packaging suppliers, we make platforms. And those platforms are really uh, a set of infrastructure. And if you look at the infrastructure that's needed to build systems, this has been changing um, over time in a sense that what we provide is a network infrastructure inside that package. So in the backlane, we're implementing a high-speed um, set of channels for the network infrastructure. Secondly, there's also the need for timing. 
and timing in certain systems is critical, and there's now a timing module that's defined that provides timing infrastructure within the system, and this is precision navigation and timing, and sometimes called the PNT module. We mentioned system management, which is new and now required, and then normalization of the power systems. So we look at trends. Um, the Ethernet, um, Ethernet interface has been increasing in speed, and today we're primarily working around a 10 gigabit infrastructure um, inside a system with Ethernet over the backlink. What will be noticed from 2010, where we had uh, first seen 100 gigabit Ethernet defined and also 40 gigabit, we've now moved as you go down the road to a number of Ethernet standards where you're seeing um, the development of 25 gigabit Ethernet, 50 gigabit, 200, and also 400. So right now we're focused at the backlink on 100 gigabit Ethernet leading ultimately up to 400. So what this does to us is it uh, requires 25 gigabit channels uh, four times, and that gives us the 100 gigabit rate. And this requires us to develop a new higher speed backlink. Um, also, similarly, with PCIe, we see PCIe moving from generation three to generation four. Generation three at eight gigabit transfers per second to generation four at 16 gigatransfers per second. So what are some of the implications of these technical trends with the interfaces increasing in speed? The backlinks now operate two and a half times faster. So we have to go from 10 gig to 25. It's two and a half time increase. So as this was mentioned before, this really requires um, good signal integrity modeling and simulations. The results out will only be as good as the signal integrity with the, uh, simulation and modeling that we do up front. This drives what was mentioned before, I think, in the Samtech presentation, is new high-speed material. So the materials become um, better at loss, and they're also more expensive. And there are several, and an example would be Megtron 7. And likely, we also have to have better connectors. So this has been an effort for some time. High-speed VPX connectors have now been introduced to run from uh, 10 gig in the RT2 to 25 gig in the RT3, and the good thing is they're backwards compatible. <clears throat> when we look at cooling techniques, these have to evolve. So as capability goes up, processing goes up, power goes up. If we look at 48.1 and 48.2, traditional cooling standards that we have now, air cooled and conduction cooled, we really run into a wall around 60 to 75 watts. So what's needed is our, our new techniques, and one of those is airflow through cooling. So the module that's down at the bottom right um, of the image is a 3U AFT module from Annapolis Microsystems, and this is um, using the 48.8 technique where air is pressed up through the side of the module, across the fins, and then out the chassis, and this allows the module to dissipate more heat on the order of two times, so we can hit a range of somewhere between 60 and 130 watts. So what challenges does this present to the packaging vendor? We now have new card guides, new channels, air plenums, all sorts of new things to deal with, and these are relatively recent, and they're required. It also requires the module vendor to come up with a really nifty complex heat sink that is uh, starting to take on new manufacturing techniques to make it. Uh, other, another area would be as we look at the um, speeds of the interfaces, we see a trend as discussed earlier with fiber optics. So we see connectors changing on the backlinks and on the modules. We need a fiber optic, optic, optic connector on the module to receive um, the I.O. Uh, with the mating connector on the backplane. Um, we're seeing standards in Vita to address this, like Vita 66.4 and Vita 66.5. And the images at the bottom of the screen show MT furls with a new light connects uh, transceiver product from uh, Reflex Photonics. And on the other side is a backlink that all makes with the MT furls and fiber optics in it at the bottom. Likewise on RF, with RF speeds increasing and density needs uh, becoming higher, we see new RF connector modules like the one on the top, which is a nano RF module. So in the power system area, um, in SOSA, 
there's been a move to simplify the number of rails that we have coming out of a power supply. So typically we'd have plus 12, plus 5, plus 3, plus and minus 12. And to um, make the uh, backplane to power supply interface more normal and to simplify it, the goal has been to reduce to 12 volt only and 3.3. So this requires the power supply modules to be re-architected. Uh, additionally, what we see is the power supply modules becoming smart with 46.11 capability being embedded in them. So now the system can query the power supply module and get information from it. That brings us to how that's done, and that's done through system management. Um, this has been around for a while, IPMB. Um, what we see is controllers on the boards with IPMCs and then a system management module to consolidate that information and process it located somewhere in the chassis. So in summary, <clears throat> new technologies and standards are having significant impacts on chassis backplane and power supply designs. We have to move our backplane designs from 10 gig to 25 gig. We'll see ethernet switches running at 3U, in 3U and 6U at 100 gig. Our next step will be PCIe interfaces moving up from Gen 3 to Gen 4 at 16 gigs a second. New cooling techniques being deployed and required for design with Vita 48.8 and liquid flow through cooling with 48.4. Um, power solutions evolving, fiber optics being used um, more prevalently, prevalently in the systems. And lastly, uh, reference designs being developed to prove out these technologies so we can uh, make the future now, I guess. <laughs> the list is long. So thank you for your time. Appreciate it.